Alright, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, welcome back to the Cinema Courtroom Show, a podcast where your favorite blockbusters await trial with your host and galactic judge, yours truly, Makram Mark. Do not forget to like and subscribe on whatever streaming platform that you're tuning into, whether it be Spotify or the Cinema Courtroom YouTube channel. Because remember, every click on the icon counts. Do not forget to ring the notification bell and share this podcast with your friends, family, cat, dog, pigeon, whomever. I don't give a shit. And now I would like to assemble all diehard Potterheads all over the nations. Avid movie watchers and book readers alike, Hermione and Draco shippers, and people who enjoy Fantastic Beasts, and people who don't enjoy Fantastic Beasts. The people who are in Hufflepuff, the people who are in Ravenclaw, the people who are in Slytherin, the people who are diehard Gryffindors. Regardless, we are going to rank every single Harry Potter title. I've yet to read the books, by the way. But, you know, as you are well aware, this is not a book review show. It's a movie review show. Now, without further ado, the Cinema Courtroom is proud to present Ranking Every Harry Potter title beginning with eighth place which is harry potter and the chamber of secrets after watching the first harry potter movie i was very looking forward to jumping to the next one immediately chamber of secrets and we get a sense of harry potter's thought process in the wizarding world and showing us some parallel past history with Tom Riddles and Hogwarts in Chamber of Secrets. So it's below in my list because I thought the editing seemed a bit off. But other than that, the only reason that I'm putting this in 8th place to begin with is because all the other Harry Potter movies are just very good, right? So, like, I'll even go as far to say that the only reason it's on, it's on the bottom of my um, list of Harry Potter titles is because it's merely a preference, less of a quality issue. Like, it's not because of what the film did wrong, if that makes sense. I will say that the actors for the children in this movie are a tad more nuanced which is a good thing in itself and evolves the ultimate story our next harry potter title for seventh place is harry potter and the sorcerer's stone now a beginning to a film series well it goes without saying here it's a risky venture to undertake. Capital expenditure, technology for the effects, most of which was rare in 2001 and very costly. As you all should know, Harry Potter is heavily reliant on those special effects. And it also relies on it to be good, as in, you know, having quality and enriching effects. Otherwise, what's the point 
of Harry Potter. Now look, Sorcerer's Stone may not have the flashiness that the other Harry Potter movies might have. Believe me, it's the second to worst Harry Potter title on my list of movies. But as a first exposure to the wizarding world, it is truly a magnificent start. And I have no gripes with this movie whatsoever, just like I have no gripes with Chamber of Secrets. I feel like I'm going to be saying this about the rest of the Harry Potter titles. You know, Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet of Fire, Order of the Phoenix, Hat Blood Prince, Deathly Hollows, Deathly Hollows Part 2, and so on. But it's true. In this first movie, you know, Sorcerer's Stone, you have the grand camera shot of Hogwarts, which means that the cinematography is fantastic. There is the magical soundtrack by John Williams himself, and that soundtrack introduces such a well-established story envisioned by J.K. Rowling. We get to see Daniel Radcliffe for the first time as Harry Potter and Emma Watson as Hermione Granger. All of that is really good and fun. As of why I even ranked it higher than the Chamber of Secrets to begin with, it's simply because I enjoyed it more. And the story had so many mysterious elements surrounding it as well, because it was a beginning chapter of a extended Harry Potter story arc. You know, we don't know why Snape has a grudge with Harry. You know, could it have just been preferential treatment or could there have been some um, deeply rooted history that the audience doesn't know yet? It, It really leaves the audience figuring it um, the next step while being satisfied by all the action and exposition as well as you know all the magic going on a- at least you know they're they're still satisfied by this movie while also craving more next is harry potter and the prisoner of azkaban sixth ranking Time travel. What's there not to love about it? Time traveling is my favorite sci fi or fantasy subject in all of storytelling fiction. When portrayed right, it probably makes the film that is portrayed in one of my favorite films to watch if it is done perfectly. And the symbolic significance that came with time travel being utilized in the prisoner of Azkaban was also quite great. Like in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry saved himself from the Dementors, unbeknownst to him at first. That gave him the realization that there will be times where you need to take the initiative and stand up for yourself. No one else is going to do it for you. At first, Harry was like, oh, my father was somehow alive. And it made me go, you know, when I was watching it for the first time, that's stupid. How can they cheapen James and Lily's death in Hodrick Hollow? Until it made sense. Harry believed that his father, James, was indeed not the one who had stopped the Dementors. But then, you know, the audience figures out that it was Harry instead because of his determination to strike back against the Dementors and save himself. Prisoner of Azkaban deserves a high rating because, you know, the camera work and special effects in that movie suppress that of Sorcerer's Stone and Chamber of Secrets, which is why Two of them are, you know, below on the list. That is also why I prefer Prisoner of Azkaban more 
because the beauty of each shot in Prisoner of Azkaban is truly a cinematic conquest that later Harry Potter movies would have to live up to, you know? And I believe that they do live up, which leads to my fifth ranking, Goblet of Fire. Harry, did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? The Goblet of Fire... <laughs> Sorry, I need to... That was pretty random. <laughs> but the Goblet of Fire goes a Vada Kedabra on the expectations of the average audience, myself included. You know what? I... Let me put it this way. I expected this movie to be a series of fun and games. Harry Potter gets a break for once since he ain't old enough to participate in the Goblet of Fire tournament. And then, to our shock, it turns out that his name was put on the list without anyone's knowledge. Harry, did you put your name on the Goblet of Fire? Said Dumbledore calmly. Like, Harry Potter is forced into a dangerous situation. And in the Goblet of Fire novel itself, it's pretty obvious and explicit that J.K. Rowling is hammering in on the coming of age story as Harry, Hermione, and Ron are heading to the early stage of their adulthood. This movie might also have the funniest moment of the entire Harry Potter franchise. Yes, even funnier than in Order of the Phoenix when um, Hermione was like, oh, you know, it sounds fun to break the rules. I, I believe that wasn't her exact quote, but it was a big character shift, and the irony of that was funny. But I think the scene, you know, that suppresses the humor in that is when Ron is forced to dance with Professor McGonagall in this movie, Goblet of Fire. And when Fred or George are doing a dog whistle, Ron tries to flip them off, but McGonagall keeps his hand on her waist. Like, the fact that there's also, like, no background music or soundtrack had definitely increased the awkwardness of that scene. You know, and the second funny scene of the Goblet of Fire is when Snape whacks Ron in the head and then he immediately, you know, hits Harry. And it, it, it just how predictable that scene was because we know that Snape doesn't, has beef with Harry. Granted, um, the build up to the third act of Goblet of Fire is quite slow. Um, I may have almost dozed off one or two times. I, I didn't fall asleep, but I was just like, chop, chop, come on, let's get a move on. And that can get annoying at times, which is why this movie is two numbers down from my top three. Harsh, I know. But it still made it to my top five because of the increased level of violence. And that's what we need to see uh, more of when, you know, a franchise is evolving. Violence. And I can see Sorcerer's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, and Prisoner of Azkaban as one separate light-hearted trilogy. But for a fourth movie, I not only expect more violence, I expect it to go dark. And I think... The Goblet of Fire has managed to embrace its dark elements to an effective degree. In fourth place is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. People seem to sleep on this movie for some odd reason. Mainly because there is more exposition than magic in action. Which I suppose people would mistake an inherently bad element of the movie. Believe me when I say that this film is underrated. Because without this movie, maybe the Harry Potter franchise would have been too rapid and rushed in terms of action. The movie before that 
Half-Blood Prince, which I'm going to review in a moment, had a fair share of action. And Order of the Phoenix definitely did as well. But considering that Deathly Hollows is building up to a final and definite conclusion of the Harry Potter franchise, it was imperative for the Deathly Hollows to establish the setting stones through character development and exposition primarily, and then go all in in part two, where the action set pieces would feel earned. Deathly Hollows part one takes care to explore the psychological struggles of Harry, Ron, and Hermione. They're on the run and trying to acquire Horcruxes in order to, to defeat Voldemort. Obviously, this prospect upsets Ron because for months he has been isolated from his mother, brothers, and Ginny. Especially Ginny, who um, is Harry's love interest. The Horcrux affects the behavior of the one who wields it. And it causes him to... It causes Ron to lash out at Harry for his incompetent planning and organization. Because they've tried to look for the rest of the Horcruxes. And we're trying to destroy the existing one in their possession. But without avail. Which then causes Ron to be furious and leaves Ron, no, leaves Harry and Hermione behind. But then Ron happens to find Harry at the last minute and save him so he can retrieve the Sword of Gryffindor. So anyway, I very much enjoyed two things about this movie, which I'm going to go over pretty quick. A. The dynamic between Hermione and Harry during Ron's absence. That dance scene between Harry and Hermione where it's one of the few times they play music that isn't in the soundtrack. Like made by a, a real life artist. It was meant to be a comforting and wholesome scene. And I think um, if that's the direction they're trying to go, they've made that loud and clear. And B... Dobby's heroic death, which was the only action-filled climax of the movie. It's good to know that Dobby died a free elf, um, no more bondage. Now, apparently in the books, he actually shows up regularly, which makes this de death even more sad for book readers. So, um, to all the book readers tuning into this podcast, I cannot even begin to comprehend how you felt when you read um, Dobby's sacrifice for the first time. I, I, I feel for you, honestly. No, I don't. Next up, to kick off our top three, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Much to the fault of Fantastic Beasts' Secrets of Dumbledore, which was a failed attempt to be a proper movie, I cover more of that in depth in episode 6 of the Cinema Courtroom, by the way, just for your information. Um, and when I reviewed The Secrets of Dumbledore, I did not give that movie a good review. And that's because of this very movie, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, which was hands down Dumbledore's movie. That's the movie we saw Dumbledore at his prime, where he unleashed the flames in that cave where they located the first Horcrux. We got to see Dumbledore at his most closest and vulnerable to Harry, at his unimpeachable intelligence, his extensive knowledge on spells that we haven't even heard of. The teleporting zip zap zippity zap one. <laughs> Looks like I forgot the name of it already. And finally, we get to witness Dumbledore at his dramatic death and funeral. Which is where all um, the students and 
staff at Hogwarts um, light up their umbrellas. So, again, this is Dumbledore's movie and Swan Song. What makes Half-Blood Prince worthy of the top three Harry Potter list is that it is a film crafted out of caliber narrative. It actually gives us what we need to know for Deathly Hollows. It essentially gives our protagonist the sheet sheet to dismantle the doomsday device for the nuclear bomb. The framework of what's to come is already paved. Alan Rickman, who plays Snape, is probably third to Heath Ledger's Joker as the most compelling, unfortunately deceased actor to play another compelling actor on screen. It's pretty um, disconcerting that when an actor dies, it's when we appreciate their performance the most. The same with Heath Ledger as the Joker and Chadwick Boseman as Black Panther. I, I, I digress to say that the scene in half Blood Prince that instantly glued my eyes to the screen was when Snape promised Bellatrix that he would protect Draco from harm. Oh, and let's not forget the attack on the burrow. The flashback of Bellatrix saying that she killed Sirius Black was definitely Harry Potter's Vietnam moment. Speaking of PTSD moments, the opening to Half-Blood Prince, which was in black and white, is a reflection of true art and filmmaking because it conveys to the audience watching the movie, hey, in case your denial about the uh, light to dark shift in tone um, of Goblet of Fire and Order of the Phoenix, this shit dark, bro. And remember, this is Dumbledore's movie. That being said, I just want to mention that the opening scene perfectly conveyed to us that Dumbledore, who I will believe to the end of time was the subject um, of Half-Blood Prince, was there for Harry, even when Harry was surrounded by autograph hounds for the Daily Prophet. So, losing Dumbledore had such a big, substantial, and lingering effect on Harry, which increased his hatred toward Snape, or at least until Deathly Hallows Part 2. Now, you may be wondering, which movie between Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 and Harry Potter and Order of the Phoenix will battle to the death for first place? Well, if you are looking for a movie that is A, filled with extensive use of magic, oh, uh, both movies have that. Alright, let's move on to B. Utter Rebellion, then the Harry Potter movie in second place is Order of the Phoenix. I really enjoyed how in Harry Potter and Order of the Phoenix, they emphasize a few world building um, elements of the Harry Potter franchise. The first thing being how they emphasize the autocratic nature of the Minister of Magic, which oversees magic um, and muggle affairs. I am really repelled by Umbridge. Umbitch. You know, she absolutely gives Bellatrix, you know, the most, one of the most cruelest witches on this earth to run for her money. What a bitch. When they gave us the scene where he, um, where Harry is, uh, misleading Umbridge and she gets abducted by centers. I raised my fist and was like, hell yes. It was like a breath of fresh freaking air. But the best scene of the movie, which is the second best scene of the entire Harry Potter franchise, actually it's the first. The Department of Mysteries where Voldemort and Obi-Wan, I mean, Dumbledore are in a duel with their lightsaber wands and spells. 
I always like to watch this movie in 4K resolution because the visual effects and CGI of the spells were absolutely mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. Is there a way, you know, that I can rewatch this in the cinema on IMAX? I would gladly open my wallet just to see Order of the Phoenix on the big screen. Like, I would willingly sacrifice my future kid, if I have any, uh, birthright just to see that movie. I hope I don't eat my words when that time comes. Something that we tend to be like, yeah, yeah, we know, is that Harry Potter is used to someone dying in front of him. Like Cedric did in Goblet of Fire. The line where Harry is protesting Umbridge restrictive OWLs, owls, course, and says, So you think Cedric Diggory dropped dead at his own accord? Now come on, don't tell me that wasn't a smart alecky line. I think it was. Okay, ladies and gents, we are now approaching the final movie of this podcast and that is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows part 2 which I have decided to put in first place now I know I know this is a very big uh, decision and it may have been predictable it may have not been but remember when I said that Half-Blood Prince was Dumbledore's movie Deathly Hollows part 2 it's pretty much Snape's movie. And here is why. Snape is the most complex character out of all the other Harry Potter ones. Because we find out in this final installment of the Harry Potter franchise. That he is a double agent working for the Dark Lord and um, Dumbledore at the same time. Now I'd like to think that's what inspired some popular double agent tropes. Um, considering uh, J.K. Rowling might have had that outlined in a draft or something in the Sorcerer's Stone novel, but on the off chance that it doesn't, the execution was bloody brilliant. It was uh, very surprising, and then it it really made sense. And that's something most plot twists don't really manage to be competent in doing. They either be unpredictable just for the sake of being unpredictable with no um, bits and pieces then and there which justify, the, you know, the twist. You know, the subverting of audience perceptions. And then, you know, it's it just becomes a mind-boggling thing in a negative way. But when you can create a... If you can structure out a narrative and have that plot twist be um, a culmination of the bits and pieces of the story for that narrative, like in Order of the Phoenix, we got a glimpse of Snape's past and his... Um, history with James Potter and uh, Lily and the fact that James was quite an asshole to him you know many people like to think that James was a noble um, you know Richard Parker kind of guy you know he was smart he um, you know was obviously responsible for conceiving Harry Potter, the chosen one, and all that, but he was, you know, the villain in Snape's story, and we say that even though Snape is a villain, I would make the assertion, though, that Snape isn't a villain, in fact, he is the most heroic character in the entire Harry Potter franchise, and that's because he gave up his reputation, he he had to watch, he watched Lily um, lie dead on the floor. And, you know, Harry Potter was just a baby, so he was probably like, 
watching from the cradle and being like, what the fuck's going on? You know, it, it's, it, and it's pretty tragic how Snape's story um, had begun and reached his end. But you you may have been wondering what else I liked about the Deathly Hallows Part 2. I just liked the, how they used how they utilized characters who we thought were insignificant, like Neville, and then they actually contribute, and everyone has a role to play in defeating Voldemort. And then the final showdown, where they pick up the wand, my god, the visuals are just as cinematic as in Order of the Phoenix, um, that fight in the Department of Mysteries, and they just blaze with their wands until one of them um, is not standing. And that is that is really a testament to how to craft a riveting conclusion. So, that being said, Snape and the final battle is what elevated um, this Harry Potter title to my number one list of the franchise. Since we have now reached the end of this podcast, thank you for tuning in to the Cinema Courtroom Show, where we critique and rank movies from worst to best. I had a lot of fun doing this podcast, so make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed Episode 7 of the Cinema Courtroom. And I hope to see you guys again in the next episode. Keep your eyes out on when that episode, episode 8, will launch on the YouTube and Spotify platform. Thank you once again for listening till the end. I had a magical time of you all um, ranking every single Harry Potter title. I am your galactic judge, Michael Mark, and I hope you have a spectacular, spectacular day. Go Ravenclaw. Hello there. Court is now dismissed.